So let's take a look at um, cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. Now CSF is really, really important. Um, not only does it have mechanical functions, it has nutritive functions and it can be involved in a number of pathological processes. For example, if it's infected, this would be meningitis. So um, in order to appreciate the, the, the anatomy and physiology of the cerebrospinal fluid, we first of all have to realize that the entirety of the central nervous system has developed from a hollow tube, that is the neural tube. And what that means is that the brain and the spinal cord are hollow. And these hollows, these cavities, are known as the brain ventricles. So if you were to um, fill the brain ventricles with a substance such as a polymer, for example, which set and then dissect away the brain tissue, you would see this very strange structure here, which represents a cast of the inside of the ventricular system. Now, the various ventricles, which we'll go through and name presently, <clears throat> each contain a structure known as the choroid plexus. Now, the choroid plexus we can see on this diagram just here. The choroid plexus is present within each of the ventricles. Of course, in the larger ventricles, such as the lateral ventricles, it is bigger than in the smaller ventricles, such as the third ventricle. But all of the brain ventricles possess um, a choroid plexus. And when you look at the choroid plexus, you note that it is richly vascularized. And in life, this highly vascular structure is producing something of the order of between six and 700 millilitres of cerebrospinal fluid per day. So choroid plexus is producing CSF all the time. And there are descriptions from the early neurosurgeons of when they first entered the ventricular uh, system surgically on living patients. When they picked up the choroid plexus in their forceps, they saw it literally dripping CSF since it's constantly producing it. Now this CSF fills the ventricular system and bathes the outside of the brain and spinal cord. It has metabolic functions, contains many, many different uh, chemicals and uh, messenger molecules, as well as having mechanical functions as well. Um, these mechanical functions are best thought of as essentially um, supporting the brain and rendering the brain buoyant within this bubble of fluid. And whenever I think about the brain bathed in CSF, I always think about um, a jellyfish within the sea. If you look at footage of a jellyfish floating in the sea, you can see it's supported, its body weight is supported by the water, and it's able to look very, very elegant, and it's able to swim. If you take that water away, that fluid away from the jellyfish, for example, when a jellyfish is washed up on the beach, you see there's quite a different state of affairs and that poor jellyfish is no longer able to support its weight and it's no longer able really to move. The same thing happens with the brain. If the brain is not supported, is not buoyed up by the cerebrospinal fluid, it will sag under its own weight and that can be a cause, a rare cause, of headaches. So let's now think about the circulation of the CSF um, and follow its path from production to ultimate reabsorption. Now we said that all of the ventricles of the brain contain choroid plexus, but the largest ventricles are the lateral ventricles. And we can see on the cast of the ventricular system, the lateral ventricles are these C-shaped structures deep within the cerebral hemispheres. And they contain the largest choroid plexi, meaning that the lateral ventricles make the majority of the CSF. If we look more closely at the lateral ventricles, we see that they have different um, defined parts. So we have the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle, which sits within the frontal lobe, the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle that sits within the occipital lobe, and the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle that sits within the temporal lobe. So each of the brain lobes has a part of the lateral ventricle filling it. Now, the majority of CSF is made in the lateral ventricles and it drains down ultimately to this point, the interventricular foramen. Now, the interventricular foramen is the point at which the two lateral ventricles converge. They converge at the interventricular foramen 
and then immediately drain into the third ventricle. Now, the third ventricle here, if we were looking at this in three dimensions, we would appreciate that the third ventricle is laterally flattened. The third ventricle is in fact squashed between the thalamus on the left and the right hand side. So the third ventricle is flattened laterally by the thalami on each side of it. The third ventricle receives the CSF from the lateral ventricles via the interventricular foramen and then drains its CSF down through this narrow pa passageway known as the cerebral aqueduct or the aqueduct of Sylvius. This cerebral aqueduct is very, very important clinically because there are a number of disorders which can lead to it becoming narrowed or even completely blocked. And you can imagine the consequences of that might be leading to dilatation of the lateral and third ventricles. So the cerebral aqueduct drains CSF from the third ventricle down into the pyramid shaped fourth ventricle. So here is the fourth ventricle. Now, whereas the third ventricle sits at the level of the thalamus, the fourth ventricle sits at the level of uh, the pons and medulla. And you can imagine that the cerebellum is sitting back here, forming the roof of the fourth ventricle. Now, it is in the fourth ventricle that the CSF escapes from the ventricular system and enters the subarachnoid space. It escapes through a number of channels, the least significant of which is the central canal of the spinal cord. The central canal of the spinal cord in humans is tiny and offers such a high resistance to the flow of CSF that no significant amount of fluid passes through it. So we can ignore the central canal of the spinal cord at this point. CSF primarily escapes from the fourth ventricle through three apertures. Two lateral apertures or lateral recesses as they're labelled in this and one midline aperture um, which is here. Oh, sorry, is here. So CSF escapes from the fourth ventricle through two lateral apertures eponymously called the foramina of Lushka and one median or midline ap aperture eponymously called the foramen of Majondi. Having passed through these openings in the fourth ventricle, and that's all that they are, they're direct holes within the wall of the fourth ventricle, the CSF is then able to escape from the ventricular system and bathe the superficial surface of the brain and spinal cord. And you know now, then that it is sat within the subarachnoid space. So if we move to this image at the top left, the subarachnoid space is depicted in green and we can see those cobweb-like adhesions between the arachnoid and the pier. Now, the CSF bays the superficial surface of the brain, brain and spinal cord within the subarachnoid space, but ultimately it is reabsorbed via these cauliflower-like outpocketings known as the arachnoid granulations. What the arachnoid granulations are essentially is evaginations of the arachnoid into the dural venous sinuses. And in fact, these granulations can occur anywhere um, where we have subarachnoid space sitting adjacent to a dural venous sinus. They even occur along the spine, but they are most prominent along the superior sagittal sinus. And we can even see the indentations of these within the skull. So what happens is that CSF enters the arachnoid granulations and via passive means, that is to say it is not pumped, it passively then enters the venous blood. So the water from the CSF crosses the wall of the arachnoid granulation to enter the venous blood. It goes then to the right atrium and then to the kidneys where it is excreted. So that is the full circuit, really, whereby CSF is produced, transported, and then reabsorbed. And it is really, really important from a clinical point of view that you have a sound appreciation of um, this system.
because blockages within the drainage of the CSF can lead to um, defined conditions whereby the ventricles can enlarge. Thank you.